Thank you for being here for the last of the Innovation Engagement Speaker Series. Uh, we have today someone that many of you are familiar with because he's, a, he's an alum of Jefferson. Uh, Nick Sigiliano has started one of the most interesting biotech companies and, uh, and it's a really interesting story about how he moved the needle uh, to get to where he is. Um, full disclosure, I met Nick completely separate and apart uh, from Jefferson through uh, an investor friend of mine and my husband's. And full disclosure, my husband and I invested in his company. So um, yeah, so I've actually got some skin in this game, which I'm really pleased about. S Nick is, uh, is extraordinary in, in a number of different ways. Uh, we know a number of people that come from what we call the Frank Baldino School of Entrepreneurship. Would that be fair to say? And for those of you who, for whom that is not a familiar name, Frank Baldino is probably the most important uh, entrepreneur that we've seen coming out of academe. He founded Cephalon, which was then purchased by Teva for $4, for $4 billion uh, after his death a number of years ago. For those of us that have been living in the biotech space for a long time in this region, it was a tremendous loss that we still feel. And, uh, and Nick has been described uh, by me and others as the next generation Frank Baldino. So we, I, know that, I know those are big shoes to fill, Nick, but, but there's a, there are a lot of people that feel that, that, that that's directionally where, where he's headed. So without further ado, let me, let me, we have a little video that we want to show you about Nick and his work, and then, uh, and then Nick will begin his presentation and, and we'll go from there. So, Anthony. I'm Nick Sigiliano. I am the co-founder and chief executive officer of Invisible Sentinel. So Invisible Sentinel is a molecular diagnostics company. First and foremost, we're a platform diagnostic that looks for the DNA of a particular target, usually a spoilage organism or a pathogen in food and beverages. The title of my talk is NUCO and overpowering the challenges that are coming along with setting up a new company. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it takes to overcome those challenges, dive into the tactics, strategies, and mindset necessary to overcome you know, what you're up against when you get a startup off the ground. I'm a proud alumni. So it's fun to come back, interact with students and faculty, let them know what I'm doing, find out what they're doing. Also proud to see all of the work that Jefferson's now doing in the innovation space, giving students exposure to entrepreneurs and innovation in the business of science. Innovation is my sport, right? It's the game that we play every day, and it's what's distinguished our company from our competitors. So if you guys go to the homepage of my website, you'll see that we call ourselves the most innovative molecular diagnostics company you know, in the space. And that wasn't something that we coined. It actually came from a third party marketing report that interviewed both our customers and our competitors. And it's what they had to say about us. So it's very validating. Nick Sigiliano back to our home campus. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate the introduction. And that was my whole introduction, so. No, seriously, it's great to be back here. I am a proud alumni. Um, it's amazing to see all the growth that's happened in the short, few short years since I've been here. Uh, really happy to see what's going on in the innovation space here in this innovation pillow that Dr. Clasco, Don and her team have set up. Um, really unique, didn't exist if, you know, five to seven years ago when I was here. And uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that I took a non-traditional path after finishing my PhD here and starting a biotech, but with the focus on innovation and what's happening with entrepreneurship, you know, perhaps in a couple of years it won't be so untraditional. So you know, when I was invited here, I, I thought a little bit about what I wanted to say and what I wanted to talk about given the theme is innovation. And Donna actually coined the title, NUCO and the Vision Powering Through the Challenges, and I thought that was very appropriate because setting up a business is a challenge in and of itself, but setting up a biotech company, especially when it requires other people's money, you know, is, takes a certain resiliency and confidence and craziness that is, is unique. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you would face. I thought it was appropriate to weave in some of my story and my company's story just to give you some context and talk about, you know, how I dealt with some of those challenges and overcame them, you know, right or wrong. It's always fun to give the talk 
you know, with 2020 hindsight, but uh, I can't always tell you that, you know, I was thinking about implementing these tactics when I was in this situation, but it just turns out that in some cases I did. So look forward to sharing with you and uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, so, all right, so basically what we did was we took a biotech from concept to commercialization. And literally this company was founded, you know, at my mother's kitchen table with my now business partner, Ben Pascal, with, with a simple concept. And uh, before I jump into that and, and kind of how we got to where we are today, I want to talk to you about some rules in case there's any aspiring entrepreneurs in the room. Is there any aspiring entrepreneurs in the room? Wow, OK. Be careful what you wish for, right? So there's some rules. You might want to pay attention to these. Rule number one. Rule number two. Okay, rule number three. So I've, I'm, how many hands do we still have up, right? All right, so let me give you some advice. Hire a therapist, hire a divorce attorney, paint something pleasant on your bedroom ceiling because you're going to be staring at it most nights, I assure you. Practice curling up in the fetal position. My chairman often calls and says, is Nick under his desk? And say hello to your new pet lion. So this is actually one of my favorite analogies, and I thought one of the most appropriate description for what it feels like to actually you know, start something like this. And it was said by Toby Thomas, the CEO of Insight Solutions. It's like a man riding a lion. Everybody looks at him and is like, wow, man, that guy's brave. Look at him on top of the lion. Meanwhile, the guy on the lion, all I'm ever thinking about is, how, one, how did I get up here? And two, how am I going to get off without getting eaten? All right, so it's really appropriate. And uh, one of the things I can do to kind of give you the context of that is the second most intimidating day I had as an entrepreneur was pretty early on when we were out raising money. It was October 2008, and we had an appointment to meet with a hedge fund in New York City. It also happened to be the same day as the single largest market drop in, like, the nation's history since the Great Depression. So we really timed that meeting. <laughs> I was shocked that they even let us into the building, yet alone came in for the meeting. These guys walked in at 4 o'clock, their ties around their knees, and frankly, they listened to our talk, but needless to say, we didn't raise any money. That was the second most intimidating day as an entrepreneur. You know what my first most intimidating day was as an entrepreneur? Anybody want to take a guess? Just shout it out. The day when somebody actually wrote me a check. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to have to do all those things I just showed you? I was just kidding. I'm going to need at least five times the amount of money. I mean, I, I can't do all that for five million. I'm going to need at least 20 million to do that. What are you guys, crazy? So uh, it's funny, like, you know, how, you know, how, how, it, uh, how it all plays out. But this is a very accurate quote for those of you that are interested in going down this route. So, again, just to give you a little bit of context, let me introduce our business, what we do. You saw a little bit in the introduction, but, and so I'll just breeze through this. So, you know, who we are, right? You know, it really comes down to the kind of the why and how of it. So we're passionate about quality. Um, basically, we make diagnostic tests for food and beverage manufacturers to ensure that their products are most importantly safe and, of course, the highest quality. So we sell food pathogen tests. You know, we're fortunate enough to do business with a lot of the biggest players in the industry. Um, we capitalize on the versatility of our platform then move in, into some other verticals, and I'll talk about that in the context of innovation and overcoming some challenges as an entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, that's essentially what we do. So we make diagnostic tools. We're a platform technology company, and we've moved into a number of different verticals. But the heart of our business is food safety and beverage quality. And then this is just a timeline to illustrate the fact that we really did take this from concept to commercialization. And it's also unique for a founder um, to continue to manage the business as it moves through different stages. So, you know, being the leader of a development company is very different from being the leader of a commercial company. I can say that my job changed completely the day we went, first day we went commercial. It's just a total different dynamic. So, you know, I'm unique in the sense that and I'm lucky, frankly, to have an opportunity to kind of run both those businesses because they're, frankly, separate companies. They might as well have been separate companies. But just to give you a snapshot of the timeline, we started back in 2006, um, raised a little bit of friends and family money, about a quarter of a million bucks, got the prototypes ready, and then hit the economic downturn right on the nose. And then quickly realized that our initial 
vision of going into hospital acquired infections wasn't going to be a reality because we couldn't raise the kind of money that you'd need to go through a 510k and the regulatory approvals and just the cost of commercialization. So we looked at other industries where a fast, easy to use, accurate, low cost diagnostic would have an impact and food safety was becoming a white hot industry. So we went food first as I put it. So there's a lot of pivoting and bobbing and weaving and I'm going to talk more about that in a couple slides, but that's kind of how we've evolved as a company. But that said, and here's the reason why I want to show you this. We started in October of 2006. By 2008, 2009, we had some prototypes. We didn't raise our first real dollar until mid-2009, and we didn't go commercial until 2014. That's how long of a path it takes to really get a biotech to revenue generation. And that's where, why other people's money is a big factor, and it really kind of changes the, you know, the dynamic of what it takes to run the business. So we ha here are some of our competitive advantages. So again, fast, easy to use, easy to implement, taking the capital equipment expense and the operational expense out of molecular diagnostics. That's what we've done. And there's you know, another, a number of other kind of value propositions that go along with the business. And then you know, it's how we line up to the competition. Again, speed to results is the holy grail in diagnostics. So we're up at top. You know, we're the fi and the next company below us, that leading competitor, that's DuPont's molecular division, and they're arguably the elephant in the room in molecular diagnostics, particularly in the food and beverage space. And you can see we're, you know, we're six to ten hours faster than them to results, and our system costs about $50,000 less from a capital equipment standpoint. So, you know, that's how kind of we line up against some of our competitors. And the other thing that we've done is, frankly, take everything in-house. So I learned a long time ago, and I don't mean any insults in case there's some CRO people in the room here, but CROs didn't work for us. So every time we contracted something out, we ran into problems, whether they were quality issues or just consistency issues. So ultimately, we brought everything in-house. So not only do I run a commercial business, but I run a manufacturing company and a research and development company as well. So we do all these things. We do them in-house. We do them at the University City Science Center. So I'll give them a plug, really give us the resources to, to, to kind of accomplish all this under the same roof, which is great. We are able to pull off the talent pool here in Philadelphia, which frankly I think is underestimated. Um, and, you know, more companies need to stay here that start here. And I think the city and the state are trying to make that happen. But that said, you know, we're really unique, so much so that Mayor Kenny had his transition party at my company because we create two different types of jobs. We create the blue-collar manufacturing jobs. But we also create jobs for talent retention in the city. So it's another kind of plug I'm, pr I'm proud of. All right, so now we're going to pivot back to what's it take to start a company. Inventors have ideas. Entrepreneurs have visions. You need to have a vision, see? An idea is not enough. So you need to be able to tie that idea to so many different things, everything from product development to revenue generation to market buy-in, et cetera. So you know, one of the things that we had out of the gate was really a vision. I mean, we saw a problem. We knew we wanted to fix it and really didn't have one idea against it, really had a vision of democratizing molecular testing. So one of the th things you need to think about for you aspiring entrepreneurs out there is, is do I have an idea or do I have a vision? The vision is seeing that idea implemented you know, in different types of applications. And the other thing you need to be aware of is you are going to have to pivot. So I stand on the shoulders of some great entrepreneurs here in Philadelphia, and Donna mentioned one of them, Frank Baldino. And I have to tell you that even the most successful companies, and Cephalon was one of them, another one was Senecor, had the wrong idea initially. In fact, all of their initial f plans failed, totally failed. It was only through the resiliency of the entrepreneurs that headed up those companies that they eventually landed on something that worked and were able to put together the business plan that ultimately allowed them to achieve their goals and be the two most successful exits in Philadelphia history. So that's a reality. So one of the big ones, and I know that I, I know some of the entrepreneurs in this room, and I can tell you that this is often the first major challenge you're going to run into finding the right investors. I have to tell you, when rubber hits the road and you start getting practical, the right investor is typically defined as the person who actually is willing to stroke a check. Because you're going to take what you can get after you realize you know, what how difficult it is to raise funds. You know, unfortunately, you can't cherry pick. Anybody who tells you you can, forget about it. They're, they've never lived it. But what I can do is give you some insight into the different types of investors and the ones I'd recommend. And the ones I would recommend under distress, because that's what you're going to be feeling when you're trying to raise money. So here's a slide that's kind of easy to interpret. 
you know, the five funding models for startups. So obviously there's bootstrapping, which isn't going to work, so you can forget that one. I don't know who made this slide. Um, they've never started a company, I can tell you that. Crowdfunding, I mean, that's cute, but it's not going to work for a biotech. Um, you know, $100,000 is, you know, isn't going to get you anywhere. It ain't even going to get you out of the lawyer's office. All right, so now there's debt funding, venture capitalists, and angel funding. So here's what I can tell you about venture capital. They don't invest in first-time entrepreneurs. And frankly, I don't know too many VCs today that invest in pre-revenue companies. Imagine that. Venture capital doesn't invest in pre-revenue companies. It's crazy, but it's true. It's only by exception that they do that. So for any aspiring entrepreneurs, particularly first-time entrepreneurs, they think they're going to get venture capital money to get their idea moving. It's probably highly unlikely, unless you're able to get some experienced entrepreneurs around the table to help you get those dollars and you have a grand vision, right? So just being realistic with you. Now, the other two types of funding, angel funding and debt funding. I'll get to angels in a minute. My recommendation to first-time entrepreneurs, and this is not the way I did it, is something called convertible notes. So the initial dollars you should get out of the gate should be convertible notes. That's what I'd recommend. If I had to do it again, that's the way I would do it. So happy to give you guys some more details about that, but I'll talk to you a little bit about how I did it. Initial money for us was angels. So the friends and family round is, is kind of, you know, it is what it is. You need enough money to get some of the IP in place, to get the prototypes. I was fortunate enough to have my business partner, Ben Pascal, who came from you know, pretty high net worth family, and was able to, uh, it was able to get us, you know, a few bucks to kind of get things moving. Then, you know, we hit a wall. We hit the economic downturn. Venture capital wasn't going to invest in us. We couldn't get institutional dollars. So we actually found two high net worth individuals who thought it was safer to invest in two first time entrepreneurs than leave their money in the stock market at that time. And we're still trying to prove them right about that decision. But that's really where it came from. I mean, you, you get resilient. And uh, you know, the subsequent rounds, and once you kind of get into angel investing, it's a little bit difficult to get out of. It's like uh, you know, you're constantly getting sucked back in, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. But we did what I'll call three major tranches of funding, highlighted on this timeline by these red dots. Um, you know, this, this was what I'll call pre-revenue funding. And the last dot was in, you know, best considered or best qualified as a family office, which is really a, you know, a high net worth family or, or collection of angel investors, but it's as close as we've gotten to what is traditionally considered institutional funding. So we did it with angels. So now the big question is, are they angels or are they devils? Well, you're going to get both, and that's the reality of it. So we have, I have to manage, I think, close to 50 different investors in our business, um, you know, that have anywhere from $25,000 to over $2 million in um, as individuals. So what I can tell you is there's pros and cons, just like anything else. But the reality is, again, for first-time entrepreneurs, you know, once you kind of get past the friends and family stage and you've got a product, this is the reality. It's angel investors, angel networks. They have these angel groups now, which are great. Um, it allows you to consolidate your presentation for, you know, instead of giving it to 50 different people, you give it to a group, and there's, they represent 50 different people. But, you know, some of these characteristics here, I can tell you, are true. I mean, sometimes you can find angels that are very value-adding. Um, they are geographically dispersed, as are mine, and they're more permissive. Um, some of them have expertise. They, they were entrepreneurs themselves, so they can bring some value to the business. You know, but you just need to acknowledge what they're not going to be able to bring to the business, right? So they're not going to be able to allow you to leverage, which is borrow debt or, or going to have, you know, venture debt people be willing to lend into you because they don't have the collateral as individuals to kind of back the business. The other thing, you know, that you've got to be aware of is that, you know, they're all going to have different expectations regarding what it means to grow the company, right? Dilution is going to be a dirty word to them. And it's frankly a dirty word to any investor, but I think the institutional investors acknowledge the fact that you're going to need more money than you think. And that's the other thing you guys better, anybody who's looking to be an entrepreneur better come to grips with. Take your business plan, times the number by five, and you're still halfway there. All right? And that's the reality of biotechnology. Now, I can't speak for other verticals, but I can tell you with confidence that in biotechnology, that's a fact. Uh, now, the disadvantage is are a little bit more obvious, right? You know, biggest one, frankly, is little follow-on money. 
So not everybody's a devil necessarily. I mean, they all you have your different dynamics with each investor, but the following money's a big deal. With institutional investors, when they make an investment in a biotech company, they know you're going to need more. Frankly, they plan for it and put a tranche away for you. Sometimes that's even built into the deal. With angel investors, if they're writing a $100,000 check, I mean, that might be the last check you ever get from them, regardless of the performance of the business or what they think of you and the company, because that's all they had to invest. They don't have a $100 million fund to work out of. It's also much more personal when you're dealing with them. This is their money. It's their kids' college funds. So it adds another different dynamic to, the, to managing your investors in the business. So you, know, you just need to be aware of that and understand what you're getting yourself into. Um, they're all going to want to say they're all masters of the universe. So are institutional investors there. So you, you know, you, that's par for the course. And obviously, you can always get a few that turn out to be devils. Now, I've been fortunate that most of my devils have been manageable. But I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't have a few. Uh, except for the investor in the room, who's absolutely wonderful, by the way. <laughs> All right, so the reality is, again, for us, or, and again, just speaking you know, from experience, we had angel investors. We got off the ground. We didn't have institutional dollars, which, other than some of the things that I highlighted here, it also means you don't have a bench. So they don't have a pool of talent to install into the company. You have to build your management team yourself, which, by the way, is a very big lift because you probably don't have those connections, and I, I sure didn't. So what do you do? This is what we did. We surrounded ourselves with aces. So Paul Tuohy is our executive chairman, and Bruce Peacock is kind of was one of our lead board members. Now, Paul and Bruce did a lot of work with Frank Baldino, who was mentioned earlier, along with Hubert Schumacher, who was the founder of Senecor. Um, Bruce Peacock is probably the premier financial executive in life sciences in the country. Uh, he was the CFO of Senecor and the COO and Frank's number two at Cephalon. And working with these guys helps you avoid a lot of the pitfalls that you would undoubtedly run into without them. So if you don't have institutional investors and you're a first time entrepreneur and you're trying to get off the ground, I'd highly recommend that you go find yourself the best people possible, the guys who had experience, who did it and lived it, to help you. These guys have been invaluable to me and my business. And frankly, it was Paul who made me a CEO. And I had no aspirations, frankly, of being a CEO. I, didn't, I was a scientist. Right? I graduated here with a PhD. I never took a business class. Frankly, an entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur didn't mean much to me. When I was a kid, an entrepreneur was either a guy who was born with a lot of money or a guy who didn't work. Either way, <laughs> that was the definition of an entrepreneur in my neighborhood. Right? So, I had no idea about any of this, right? So, uh, you know, I went into the company thinking I was at best going to be a chief scientific officer. And uh, we actually brought Paul on to be our CEO, which was the commercial round that we did or the round of financing that we did to go commercial. And, and I'll tell you this story because, you know, this is the reality of kind of living, you know, the, the experience that I've had here. We brought Paul in to be our CEO when we raised $7 million at the end of 2013 to go commercial. I been a development, I was the chief operating officer of this company and the co-founder at the time. My business partner, Ben, who had an MBA, he was the, the acting CEO. But we both realized that, for lack of a better term, we were going to need a little gray hair, hair to, one, raise commercialization dollars, and two, take the business commercial. So we, we were lucky enough to be able to recruit Paul in, who was a board member at the time, and decided to step away from his job at Fujiri Biodiagnostics, which was Senecor Diagnostic, which, by the way, is the largest cancer diagnostic company that you've never heard of because they OEM all their products. He took that business from $30 million a year to $600 million a year in the 10 to 12 years that he was a CEO. So this guy's an icon in the space. Anyway, we bring him in. I'm so excited to have him. He's on the job for like 60 days, and one night he calls me at about 8 o'clock at night and says, Nick, uh, do me a favor. I need you to get the boardroom 9 a.m. tomorrow. I want to meet with you. And then I want you to take the rest of the day off. Paul, why don't you just tell me what you're going to tell me now? Because like, I don't sleep as it is, but I'm really not going to sleep tonight. So why do I have to wait till 9? Why don't you just tell me what you want to tell me? Are you really going to do this to me? So he's like, 9 a.m., boardroom, take the rest of the day off. Great. So I walk into that meeting figuring the worst, right? I'm like, Paul, I get it. I start talking before we even sit down. I get it. This isn't what you thought. You came from a big company. We're a small company. You don't want to work here. I'm trying to make it easy for him to leave because that's what I assume he wants to talk to me about. He's like, no, 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 no. He's like, sit down. He's like, I'm not the CEO of this company. 
And I was like, no, I know that. I'm just saying you can leave. It's okay. We'll figure it out. He's like, no, no, no. I'm not the CEO of this company because you're the CEO. I was like, no, you're having me confused with Ben. I'm the CEO. My name's Nick Siciliano. Let me pull my business card out just to remind you who, I, who you're talking to. Because sometimes you confuse me with Ben. He's like, you're not listening. I interviewed every person at this company in the last 60 days I was here. You've been the CEO of this business. You're going to be the CEO of this business. I convened the board last night, and they all voted you unanimously as the CEO of this business. I'm going to bring Ben in here and tell him that. You take the rest of the day off. Tomorrow morning, you meet with Ben first thing, and you two guys work this out. I'm going to stay on as your executive chair and mentor you in being a CEO. That's what it means to surround yourself with aces. That's the opportunity that this man gave me and that you know I've been able to you know, enjoy over the past couple of years. And I would have never had this learning experience if it wasn't for him. And these guys have helped me avoid a lot of the pitfalls that a first-time CEO would run into. So I'm forever grateful, but this is absolutely paramount for anybody aspiring to kind of start a business, particularly in biotech and in, in the Philadelphia area. Don't steal my aces. All right, so the other one is you really got to know your market and your competition. So again, a lot of the people that I'm talking to here are probably scientists, either first or second. You really got to understand the value of market analysis. You got to know your market size. You got to know your accessible market. You've really got to do the work here. I would advise you to take some of that initial seed funding, not a whole lot. Don't go out and hire McKinsey, but go spend a little bit of money getting a professional market analysis done. So that way you're not kidding yourself. I mean, again, that's the difference between an idea and a vision. A vision has a little bit more execution associated with than just an idea. Like we can come up with great product ideas right now around, around these tables, but a vision is going to require a little bit more than that. It's going to require you making sure that you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's and you understand how to actually execute it. The other one is know your competition and know how you stack against your competition. This is absolutely imperative. If you guys don't do this, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Um, by the way, we didn't do, we didn't do this. Again, that's part of my 2020 hindsight. So guess what we found out? Great accessible market. Food safety, no brainer. Billion dollars. It's fun to sign numbers to things, right? What we didn't understand was something called the adoption curve. See, now, if I would have spent $20,000, I would have learned, I would have known about it. None of my advisors knew about it. None of us knew about it. We all thought we were too smart. We were wrong. Guess what the adoption curve is for a food safety diagnostic? Years. That's right. Not 30 days, not 60 days, not 90 days, not even six months. Years. Uh-oh. So now I've got this commercial money. I'm the CEO of the business. I'm flying high. And everybody loves our products. The demos are going great. It works better than everything else. All the science is you know, firing on all cylinders but nobody's stroking a check. Uh-oh. Now I gotta go back to my investors and go, what do we do now? So one of the things you have to be prepared to do, even if, by the way, you do do this market research, is you are going to be surprised, because even the best research report can't predict. Nobody has a crystal ball. So be prepared to pivot. If you are not able to pivot, don't get into this business. If you think your business plan is perfect, you're wrong. You're gonna have to update it daily. So here's what happens. You, you, we know our market. We know our product. We know what everything's great. Then we try to get to market. We try to get validation. Validation's not, hey, I love your product, not, hey, it works better than anything else. Validation is when people write checks and purchase your product. That's the difference between a pre-revenue and a post-revenue company, even more so a post-earnings company. That's validation. You don't have validation until people are buying your product which means that during development, you don't have a product to sell, so you don't have anything close to validation. Be prepared to pivot. This is when it happens. So we said, uh-oh. And here's the other thing I love. Every business plan is based on a set of what they call critical assumptions. This is what allows you to go crawling back to your investors and say, hey, one of our critical assumptions was wrong. I need more money. By the way, you're going to do that too, and be prepared to do it. But as long as you put a set of critical assumptions in front of them and you acknowledge that these are critical assumptions based off of hopefully good work, market studies, et cetera, because again, no one has a crystal ball, they'll forgive you and they'll work with you. Now, institutional investors are a little bit more forgiving because they understand it. 
angels, not that they're not forgiving, but they're not working out of 20, $100 million funds. They wrote you a $100,000 check, and that's the check they had to write you. So just be advised of that. We predicted, one of our critical assumptions was greater than 40 accounts in fiscal year 2014. It was actually imperative that we hit this mark. That was our food acquisition trend in 2014. Uh-oh, what do you do? So we looked at other industries where a fast, easy to use rapid diagnostic would have had a lot of legs and the R&D that we had done to date would have an impact. Guess what we found? The wine industry. That's right. Jackson Family Wines had given us a call just serendipitously out of the blue and said, hey, Nick, uh, saw an ad for your food safety platform in uh, Food Magazine. Really love it. Can you make something for in-winery testing of spoilage organisms at wineries? Absolutely. <laughs> Be prepared to pivot, right? So we did. We worked with Jackson Family Wines in developing them. That's Kendall Jackson. They're the fifth largest wine conglomerate in the world. We built them a test for testing their wine during production for spoilage yeast. And we took what was taking them 10 to 14 to day, days to do on site down to four hours. So it was a big deal. Um, long story short, the product took off. It's in a non-regulated industry. We didn't have the same sales cycle. We were able to survive, right? So buying time, pivoting, all part of the key to success. We were able to get our north of our 40 accounts because we did it, and it did a couple things for us, right? So here's why they need to pivot, right? A startup organization, by definition, is in search of a repeatable and scalable business model. As I mentioned, most models are wrong, especially when you start getting into therapeutics, when even if the business model's right, if the drug doesn't get through phase one, phase two, or phase three, guess what? You don't have a company, right? So all of these things, you know, are going to require you to be able to have, be able to put multiple shots on goal. You have to be able to pivot quickly, rapid, and often. You can't lock up with your business plan. Your investors may want you to. People talk about focus. There's a definition between focus and being willing to pivot, and you have to understand that. And again, pivots are the reason that startups have to be agile and opportunistic. Well, this pivot added a lot of value for us. Obviously, it allowed us to hit our first year objective for account acquisition, but it also allowed us to build this program called our Custom Solution Program. And guess what we did? We did it again and again and again, and it opened up new verticals for our company. So we did it in wine. Then we turned around, and I didn't get a call from anybody in beer, but I was like, Kraft is booming. These guys have the same problem in beer? Guess what they did? We built it in beer. Then we went into fruit juice. Refresco Gerber is the largest third-party bottler in Europe. They bottle for Ocean Spray, Welch's, you name it. Built them a test in fruit juice. Then guess where we went? Soft drinks. Bet you they have problems too. We built a test for Coke. And by the way, buying us that time in 2014, that's beer, food, and wine after 2014. You have to be willing to pivot. Everybody thought I was crazy when I said I was going to go into wine. I went out to wine country. I made six trips. I got Paul, my chairman, calling me. What are you doing? Boozing out there? You having a good time? You got five food accounts. You better get home and sell some food product. I said, Paul, these guys are talking about two or three year sales cycles. I said, I got to find something else. He said, all right. He said, you better make it work. He told me to buy a one-way ticket and not to come home from JFW without a signed contract. That's a true story, too. I didn't buy a one-way ticket. I made sure I had a return ticket. You know, I have a wife, thank God. <laughs> but no, this is what you deal with. I mean, just be, you could just, I'm just telling you the truth, and this is what you, these are the kind of calls you get and the way you have to respond. So anyway, today, look, I'm proud to say, you know, we've grown to be a really successful business, at least in the context of, you know, startup, the startup biotech world. We grew to be the biggest company in the incubator and uh, down in University City, uh, the Science Center, and then we built our own space out. You know, we now service over 350 sites in the United States. We sell to over 60 countries via 25 distribution partners. We continue to do development deals. We've now moved into human genomics, clinical applications with Merck. Um, we've actually just, believe it or not, gotten into the tobacco industry with another custom solution deal. Believe it, they're spoilage products in tobacco, right? Who knew? So, and then again, you know, from a performance standpoint, we continue to grow the business 75% year over year. Uh, which is a pretty big clip for a company like ours, who's frankly, you know, never had institutional capital or that bulls of capital to kind of flood the zone with salespeople, which, by the way, might have been the strategy, right or wrong, had we had institutional funding. But, 
you know, I'm proud to say we've done a pretty good job. And the last tip for all you aspiring entrepreneurs out there is always be closing. So anybody here looking to join a great, dynamic, growing company in Philadelphia, please stop by our website or come talk to me. We're always looking for the best talent. I know Jefferson has a lot of it. Again, proud to be an alumni here, proud to be talking to you today, and happy to take any questions. I'm sure, oh, let me start with Heather, one of my colleagues. That was great. I think you could have a job as a motivational or demotivational speaker, <laughs> <laughs> educational speaker, if, if this doesn't, uh, if you ever decide to shift gears, that was really awesome and, and funny too. Um, curious if you have any IP lesson learned, yes. lessons learned that you'd like to share too. So one of the things I actually took some slides out was hire the best IP attorney, IP attorney you can. So we have, I think, uh, 16 issued patents. We filed broadly uh, 180 countries. So we did invest in our IP portfolio, and that's really important to do. You only have one chance to do that right, by the way. It's up front. You have to spend the money up front if you're serious about your business. You cannot skimp on IP. So we did. We work with, uh, I'll give a plug to our IP attorney, Dan Skolnick at Pepper Hamilton. Uh, he's one of the best in the city. Next. Anybody else? Oh, of course. Dean Grunwald. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Indeed, the college is extraordinarily proud of you and your success. Uh, your discussion of uh, the process, pivot points, uh, re reminds me of, uh, frankly, in some ways, running a, an academic research laboratory. You do your homework, you make your plans, you think you know you're headed, and then, oops, you know, revise that hypothesis. So my question is uh, twofold. One, uh, although you were, you're saying, well, I was a PhD, didn't take business and such, but here you are. Were there elements of your scientific training that nevertheless mentally, conceptually prepared you for your path? And two, um, you said that when you were here as our student, we didn't have some of the resources we have today. Uh, what might be some recommendations you have as we recognize that indeed our students have many different pathways ahead of them? Uh, what should we uh, make sure we have in our curriculum outside the standard uh, lab science uh, to, to help folks get along these various pathways? Sure, okay, so uh, part, first part of the question. You know, my, my training as a scientist absolutely benefited me, you know, throughout this experience, even as a CEO. So obviously, my, your problem-solving skills that are required in a laboratory are absolutely imperative, you know, when you're running a biotech, because not only are you gonna have to problem-solve, as I told you some of the anecdotes on the business side, but the science isn't always gonna be perfect. And you have to be able to you know, pivot there as well. So we've done a lot of that. And frankly, pivoting is something I've learned through the years of training that I had here. Nothing ever went right when, during, in my PhD research. And I know some of us probably feel the same way. But you know, we managed to get through it, right? And uh, a, lot of that, a lot of that kind of carried over to my experience today is in the business world. With regard to the resources here, it's just great to see this focus on entrepreneurship. It wasn't something that you know really was uh, kind of in the cards when I was here. The other piece is, uh, you know, the students now have access to groups like BizBio, which I think is fantastic. I applaud those students for setting that up and for continuing that. It just can seem to grow more and more every time I come back, and uh, and also just giving them some access to classes, you know, to understand a little bit about company capitalization. I mean, I don't think. Anybody needs an accounting class, but you know how to read a P&L, how to read a balance sheet, some access to some of those skills. It, it, it would, you know, would help reduce the learning curve for anybody who decided to take a path similar to mine. Next. Right. This is this is a wonderful experience, Nick. Now I remember visiting your labs and seeing how wonderfully you were doing all of your own in-house manufacturing and science. <clears throat> One. I wonder how hard it was to get your investors to, to approve those expenditures, because that's unorthodox. But two, it's very much like what uh, Amgen went through when they bought their own plant to make erythropoietin. Let me make this play. And then, why are the big pharmas now outsourcing everything if doing it yourself is the best way to, to control it, make sure it's done right? To, to some great questions. So it was very hard, and it's, by the way, it continues to be hard to get investors to fund R&D, especially now, right? We're a revenue-generating company. What are you guys doing? Put more salespeople on the street, right? 
But you know, what's interesting is like, you know, I can tell you, we wouldn't be able to get into these verticals without development, right? And the human, some of the things we're working on right now in human genomics, I mean, could be extremely lucrative to the business and value driving. So part of that is being able to lean on my science skills to really articulate the value to them and be able to present a business case about it. If I didn't have the scientific background, I would be at a significant shortfall being able to do that. So for all of you guys that are here and learning science, I have to tell you, it's, it will go a long way in adding value because you can have a business discussion and a scientific discussion at the same time. The key is to be able to translate to the business people and the investors the value of what they're investing in. And the second part of your question is a great one too. And I think the reason comes down to risk. It is risky to develop your own products and very costly. I think the big you know, pharma companies who are much more bottom line focused these days are risk averse and figure let somebody else take the gamble and we'll, and we'll cherry pick. The guys who gambled and got it right or won, we'll buy them, right? And that way we don't have to take the losses too. I think, you know, if I had to oversimplify it, that's the strategy. It's unfortunate for us scientists. Uh, could you uh, let us know a little bit more about how you made the transition from completing your PhD to getting the company off the ground, both from a financial and a timeline perspective and sort of the obstacles that you hit? Because I think as someone that's thinking about constantly like new projects, I think that the um, bridge between a vision and putting it in place is something that I don't quite see how the dots are connected. Sure. I mean, I could summarize it in three words, with extreme difficulty, right? Um, you know, it's a balancing act like anything else. I mean, let me see what good advice I could give you that doesn't sound like I'm pontificating. Um, you got to get done here first. And I know that all the, acad all the professors in the room are ready to applaud, but I'm, I'm actually not kidding you. Because people think multitasking is great and important. I think it's inefficient, right? Especially when you're, it's double life type of multitasking. And that's what, you, what I did. And I have to tell you that, you know, it is what it is. It turned out okay for me. It was a really difficult time for me to juggle both and, and try to juggle both. And I was fortunate enough that I had done some good work in my, with my PI, and my PI was very understanding, you know, and gave me a little bit of latitude towards the end of my PhD to do it. But frankly, that's atypical too, right? Um, the reality of it is it was very, very hard on me. And I don't miss those days at all. So my advice to you, and I mean it's heartfelt, is finish this first. Put all your effort into finishing this. Draft all of your concepts and ideas. You can start having conversation. Some of those initial conversations as to where do I start is with service providers. Go find yourself an attorney. He's not going to take your money. Start talking to attorneys about, you know, corporate biotech attorneys, and I can recommend a few about your vision and your idea. They love young entrepreneurs. They love giving feedback. They really can be trail guides. They'll help you shape that plan a little bit while well, you can focus your energies, at least technically, on, get, on you know, kind of getting your education finished. Because what I did is, frankly, there was just too much luck involved. You know, the fact that I'm standing here, and by the way, I mean it when I say I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people. Two, two of the pictures that I showed you, as well as guys that have been here before me, I got very lucky. This is, the, you know, most of the guys I know that tried something like this didn't get lucky. Nick, I'm just going to ask, a, I'm just going to uh, note for the record and hand the microphone to this gentleman who has a question. Luck comes to the prepared, and you prepared to be lucky. So I'm just going to leave that. everyone with that thought. Please ask your question. <clears throat> just to follow up on Dr. Gridwald's question, and I'm the VP of uh, Strategic Development here for BizBio, so thank you for acknowledging uh, the student organization. Um, as a PhD student, how important was it for you to co-found your company with somebody with an MBA? Um, to you know, leverage that skill set in the beginning. I you know I you know I can't speak enough about complementary skill sets, especially when starting a company. It's just so you know these types of bio, a biotechnology company again, right? It's just so multifaceted that having complementary skill sets is imperative. You know, and again, 2020 hindsight, I wish I had somebody with commercial experience, right? Mm -hmm. Probably could have avoided a lot of pitfalls early on. So I would encourage people who are looking to do this, and to the gentleman who just asked me the question about putting the dots together. Start looking at a team. Start looking at who your partners would be, or who you'd want to. And by the way, the 
the service providers, the lawyers in the space, even some of the accounts in the space, I have to tell you, their networks are unbelievable. And they love being trail guides. So they can actually help you kind of build that network and say, hey, I know somebody who's got great commercial expertise you should talk to. Just building those relationships now and establishing yourself, going to some of the meetings that the industry holds. Like, I don't see any students really at some of the life science meetings here, although we try to get the word out. You should be going to them. Philadelphia is a close knit group here. Everybody knows everybody. So get your name and you're out there, start meeting people. And the more multifaceted, more dynamic your team is coming out of the gate, the higher the likelihood for success. Somebody else? Any other questions? So, oh, okay. Um, yes, you, of course you may. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Nick. Uh, great no presentation. Um, you have such a compelling story. Thanks for sharing it here today. And so in taking uh, technology from concept to, to product, uh, just wondering if you could share, uh, like, from your perspective, some of the differences, uh, like, operationally, like, what you have to do to, to, you know, to get a, you know, a research uh, stage technology to the market, um, and is there is there a point at which there's just like a switch that you have to flip and and you know, kind of change mindset, change culture within the company? Um, so yeah, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, obviously, that was one of the biggest challenges that I faced, I think, you know, personally and professionally, was going from, you know, this scientist that was running a development company to then, I mean, it, I wish it was as easy as, or it could be, you know, encapsulated in flipping a switch going to a commercial company. There were so many things I didn't know, like logistics, for instance. Like, great, I can build the product. How do I ship it, right? How do I package it? How do I ship it? What are the shipping regulations? What do you mean dry ice is a problem, right? Like. It's just all these little things that kind of come in to when you make the transition from a development company into a commercial company. I mean, not to mention the fact managing a sales team is the hardest thing there's to do in management. I mean, it is just, it is the most challenging. And then we start thinking about, because we had already done some marketing. Marketing, yeah, you put some advertising. It doesn't seem too complicated, right? It is, by the way, but I'll oversimplify it for this. But then it's the sales team and then really setting up the infrastructure in the company to build a product, make sure quality is there, building that whole quality silo, and then obviously, you know, getting the product out to customers and responding to customers. I mean, all of those things we did iteratively, right? We, we you know, and most companies, frankly, that have institutional capital, a bigger bullets of capital, this is where that bench, that institutional investors really comes in handy, because they can bring in consulting teams to help you build this infrastructure and put these pieces in place rather than kind of having to learn on the job like we did. But you know, it, it, it was definitely one of the biggest challenges that I faced as a CEO of the business. Uh, uh, one of the companies that has been in the news these days, uh, one of the diagnostic companies is Theranos. Now, that was the company that started off with big promises. They got in tons of money and they were valued like at $9 billion a couple of years ago and now they have just gone bust. So uh, as a co-founder of a diagnostic company, what, what lessons do uh, you think we can learn from these kind of failures of companies? Keep your feet on the ground, first off. Manage your investors' expectations. You have to be able to manage expectations. I think, I think she just got lost in it all. You know, I have to be honest with you, as a scientist, and again, you know, turn the cameras off, but I wish that company was public so I could have sold it short. Because anybody who thought you were going to be able to get the sun from a, a finger prick of blood was, I don't know what some of these guys, it just goes to show you, and by the way, this is important too, the story is more important, and the team is more important than the technology. If you can spin a good story, you can get funded. Now the problem is that she spun a great story and got a lot of other very important people excited whose feet weren't touching the ground. Keep your feet on the ground, manage expectations, and under promise and over deliver. Don't over promise and under deliver. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'd be honest with you. I hate to, I, I, I don't mean to sound like I, I had a crystal ball on this one, but I saw that one coming. I and mean, I think a lot of scientists did too. So I'll just, I'll just add on to that because uh, recently I just met one of the, uh, one, uh, one person. She's working for a startup accelerator in San Francisco. And uh, one of her colleagues had a chance to work with, a uh, chance to interview one of these uh, uh, workers of this uh, Theranos uh, two, three years ago. And what she was telling me was uh, the one of the uh, uh, big, big pro reasons for the failure of this company was the amount of pressure 
that they build up in the Silicon Valley, like in that San Francisco area, Stanford area, the, the amount of pressure they have to, uh, they build up to deliver the products. That's huge, and that's one of the reasons why she was saying, you know, she had to, she had to show those kind of things to to raise that kind of money, and that was the reason for her failure. Yeah, I, I that think that's, I think that's dead on. You have to be careful not, to, and this is something that's going to happen. So for the scientists in the room that are talking to your investors about the science and the potential or prospective value of that science, you cannot let them run away with it. We had investors early on that were like, we can slap this on the inside of a chicken package and you can go to the supermarket and a line shows up. No, 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 you can't. It's a good idea, but no, that doesn't work. That's called solid state color change and that doesn't happen to exist in this universe without heat or liquid. So no, no, that, that won't work, right? So unless we can do that and develop that in another universe, I can't get behind that. They'll, these guys, especially when you start getting these Wall Street guys and these investors, and they'll try to sell anything. You got to manage your investors. Nick, I'm going to just ask a, a final question. And probably other people are wondering this too. What did you do your PhD in? What was the nature of your scientific work while you were here at Jefferson? Immunology and microbial pathogenesis, specifically antigen presentation. So MHC class one and MHC class two, antigen presentation and virology and oncology. All right, for those of you in that field, there's another opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back to your alma mater and for enlightening everyone here today. Thank Proud you. Proud to be guys. here. Thanks for having me.